بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We ask and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us among those who learn beneficial knowledge and that he makes us amongst those who benefit from that which they learn and that he makes us amongst those who apply their knowledge in a good manner inshallah ta'ala so today uh, we are going to go through um, and for the next few weeks my estimate is that it will take us up, up until the end of the semester so up until about December to actually um, thoroughly go through this book it's a very helpful book this book we did go over it very briefly um, last year but I don't we never actually gave it its true uh, right um, or its true place inshallah ta'ala if by the way some of the sisters want to bring chairs from the sisters of Musallah to sit down or anything like this feel free to do so there are chairs um, over there if you don't want to sit down on the floor and if anybody here on the brother's side wants to use the chairs feel free to do so you don't have to just sit on the floor if you want to take notes please do so take notes take thorough notes inshallah um, and uh, we'll, we'll go through there so this is Hilyat Talib Al-Ilm and this is translated as the seeker's regalia. And this is actually a good translation that we found. Um, the, I have the PDF, so if, you do not, if, you, if you're not on our email list, I do have an email list specific for this class series. If you are not on our email list, please see me after the class and I can add you. I've sent all the PDFs already. There's an Arabic PDF. There is the English abridged translation. And it's abridged, meaning it's not completely full. Um, and it loses, so it only contains the main points. And one of the unfortunate things is that it loses a lot of what the author originally wrote. So in Arabic, in the Arabic version, Hilal Talib al Ilm, the author is Bakr Abu Zayd, Rahimahullah. He is a scholar who passed away in 2011. May Allah have mercy upon him. So about six years ago. And um, this scholar was not known. Um, for giving fiery lectures. He was not, he didn't have a really um, khitaba and so on and so forth. However, his books are of the most amazing books you can read in the Arabic language. His actual command of Arabi, of Arabic, was beyond anything that you'll ever see from a modern um, Arabic speaker. Um, and this is why reading it in the Arabic, if you can, you'll have such a deeper appreciation for everything that he says. This is why the, translating it in its full proved to be very difficult because um, in the explanation for his book, which now, so his original book is about 110, 120 pages, I believe. And then the explanation of that book is 400 pages. Explaining the 120 page book is 400 pages in Arabic. And the Sharih, the explainer of it is Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, and he's actually much more knowledgeable than Bakr Abu Zayd. Much more knowledgeable. But he said, I'm explaining this book because it's invaluable. Uh, its importance is, is to such an extreme level. Number two. And then number three, he says his Arabic that he uses is so deep and profound and beautiful that a lot of people won't appreciate it unless we actually explain it. This is why the explanation is actually needed because of the power of the Arabic that he uses um, in his original book. Um, so it's a very beautiful book. Um, it's a necessary book. Um, and uh, the author put a lot of thought into it. He didn't expand on certain topics. He did expand on others. Um, and so we'll try to, to follow more or less what the author had originally intended, inshallah ta'ala. So, first slide. We're going to explain the title. Who is a seeker and what is regalia? <laughs> Who is a seeker and what is regalia? This is not a Harry Potter reference. Okay? When it's saying who is a seeker, we're not talking about that type of seeker. What type of seeker are we speaking about? Huh? Yes, a speaker of? A seeker of Islam, a seeker of knowledge. Anyone more particular? Okay, so one definition can be the seeker of 
sacred Islamic knowledge. Okay? I disagree with though with this um, definition. This is why there's a, there's a deeper definition. It's the seeker of any knowledge that has a benefit in the hereafter. Yeah, over here. Okay, any knowledge that will help benefit in my hereafter. So that could be any knowledge, really. I can study the stars, and if that actually helps me in my hereafter, it gets me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is actually beneficial knowledge to me. Okay? Now, of course, there are agreed upon knowledges that everybody should have, right? A basic knowledge of Islam, a basic knowledge of uh, Tawheed, a basic knowledge of, of how to practice and be a good Muslim. This is needed regardless. And some of these other sciences, they might help one person, but another person, they might not help as much. But in the end, I think we can all agree on this definition that it's any knowledge, it's a seeker. So what does it mean to seek? This means you look for it, you're going after it. It's something that you want. Okay? And this is why it's very important for us to understand a concept. Knowledge is not given, knowledge is taken. I'm going to repeat this again. Knowledge is not given, Knowledge is taken. You have to take it. <laughs> you have to seek it. I can talk until my mouth is dry and I can no longer speak anymore. That doesn't mean that you'll learn anything. You're only going to learn what you take, what you seek, what you seek out. Okay? And there's a difference. A person thinks that just because I attended a lecture means that خلاص, I actually know it. No, no, no. It doesn't mean anything. You actually have to go after it. You have to run after it. You have to want it. Do you guys want to learn? This is the question you have to ask, answer yourself. Yes, this is something that I want. Okay? This is why when there was a king alive at the time of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, the king said, Ya Imam, I want you to come to my palace and I want you to teach my two children. So the king had two sons. They were princes. They were going to become rulers after him. Okay? He says, I want, you to come to, uh, I want you to come to the palace and to teach my two kids. What did Imam Bukhari say? He said, knowledge is sought, it is not brought. Knowledge should be sought after. You come to me if you want to learn. I don't go to you. <laughs> okay? Because they're not going to learn if this is how they're going to do it. He knew being a natural teacher that he was, that if he was coming to them and they didn't really want it, then they're not going to learn anything. They actually have to come out and seek it. You have to go for it. Because that effort that you put in actually shows it. This is why, by the way, one of my Mashaykh, my teachers, he used to give his lecture at one point for a certain group of students out in the middle of the desert, where it's even not accessible by car. They would have to park, <laughs> And they have to get out of their cars and walk for a mile and then they get to the place where the lecture is being held. And the Shaykh did this on purpose. And many of the students didn't like it. They're like, why is this, you know, the lecture is so far out there. Why do I have to go all the way out of my way? You know what I mean? And it's like, it's so difficult. And the Shaykh said, he says, because knowledge is sought. Talab, you have to seek it. I'm not going to come to you. Plus, I want you to exert that effort. He said, that when by the time they got there, they were tired. And once they were tired, they, their, their shield broke down. This defense that we have that blocks out a lot of what we hear and what we, what we pay attention to. And now they're at a weaker physical state. And they'll actually be more receptive to what's being said. Okay? This is why studies have also shown that if you give... And they did this study. So what's the study? They separated, they had two groups of students. One group of students, they gave them books where the font was really hard to read. It's a difficult font. It's tiny, and they have to read it, and it's really hard to really see what's going on. And the other group, they gave them a book that's very clear, okay, and very legible, and, and it's not difficult to read. The group, which group do you think learned more and had more retention? The little font group, the difficult font, or the easy font? The, why, okay, why would the difficult font be, be able to read better? Yes? They try to understand it better. They, they look for it. Okay, they try to understand it better. Yeah? It was because, go ahead. They had to look for it. They had to exert more effort reading it. Whenever you have to exert more effort, 
reading it or appreciating it, you'll actually retain more than when it comes easy for you. But this is good. Good job. Okay? So what I'm saying is, seeking actually means that you want it. You look for it, and when you look for it, you're going to retain more. If you're not looking for this information, it's going to go, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. Okay? Tayyib. History and the Islamic awakening. Has anybody heard this term, by the way? The Islamic awakening. Raise your hand if you've heard this term before. As-Sahwatul Islamiyyah. Uh -huh. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Anyone else has heard this term at all? One, two, okay, three, good. What do we mean by this? So this is actually in the author's introduction, at Bakr Abu Zayd. He said that his intention in writing this was to help people during this era that he called the Islamic awakening. He says, right now we are alive at a time that's known as the Islamic awakening. This is now. Okay? What does this mean? This means that now we are experiencing a time when more and more people are actually turning to Islam. Whether they are born Muslims, whether they are converting to Islam, whether they were not practicing before, now they've decided that, okay, I need to practice this religion of mine. Whatever the cause is, more and more people are actually turning to Islam, which means that it's a great time to be a Muslim. Now, a person might argue, well, Shaykh, but look at what's going on to the Muslim Ummah right now. There's people that are dying, there's people that are being slaughtering, you know, they're slaughtered, the Rohingya, you know what I mean, the, the civil war in Syria, what's going on to the people in Gaza, what's going on all over the world. So, these are very sad tragedies, we agree. Okay, that's not a good thing. It's not a completely rosy picture. This is why it's called the awakening. But it doesn't mean that the ummah is fully awake. <laughs> okay? It doesn't mean that the ummah is fully aware and, and everything is good. But it means that before Allah, a huge swath of the ummah was completely asleep. And now slowly people are waking up. And the awakening is that they're becoming more aware of their religion. They're becoming more aware of what it is that they need to do to become good Muslims. A lot of them are actually going out of the way and learning more about Islam. A lot of people are attending classes like this. A class like this would be unheard of just a few decades ago. Okay? When did this whole thing start? Some people put different eras, the 60s, 70s, 80s. But roughly this is when it started to really gain track up until the 90s, up until now. And it's still, alhamdulillah, on track. Now, are there Muslims, Muslims within the Muslim Ummah who are trying to fight this? Yes, there are. And in fact, you can argue that there are more Islamophobic Muslims than there are Islamophobic non-Muslims. <laughs> Muslims who claim to be Muslim, but they tell you you don't need to learn. You don't need to go seek out knowledge. You don't need to become practicing. You don't need to become more rigid in, in, your, in your practice. You know what I mean? You need to, uh, Islam is, is, is for when you're old, you know what I mean, and you're retired, and you can become religious then. But while you're young and still living your life, just live your life, yaqi. Why are you so rigid? Why, do you, you know, why are you doing the things that you're doing? Okay? So this is why he wrote this book to help the Muslims who wanted to become awake, who wanted to become more practicing, and how to actually apply that. Best, this is it. And this is what he said his intention was in writing this, because there was a danger. Where's the danger? And we're going to get to this discussion here in a second. The danger is when a person gains knowledge, and they don't rightly apply that knowledge, what happens? It can actually turn people away from Islam. If I become knowledgeable in certain issues in Islam, but then I'm very strict on how I apply them, and I'm very rigid, and I try to force myself, I can actually turn people away. And his whole goal was to make people, yes, understand knowledge, make people more knowledgeable, but make them so that they actually attract people to Islam, not the other way around, not repelling. Because we shouldn't be repelling people, we should be actually bringing them closer. Okay? طيب, now we're going to answer the second question. The question of regalia. What does the word regalia mean? Does anybody know? Regalia. Yes. Regalia means like your profession. Uh, what, you, what you do. Your profession, what you do. Okay. Close. Yes. Ornament? Ornament. Yes. Decoration and ornament. Good. That's actually correct. Okay. It's something that you wear that identifies your profession or your position. This is why Regal 
actually means it's another term for the royalty. And royalty, they wear certain things to show that they're royalty. So a king, what does he wear in order to show that he's a king? Huh? A crown. What else? Gold, plated stuff, right? A big robe. He might have a staff. He has a big belly. Okay, that's it. <laughs> You're thinking of Santa Claus, but it doesn't exist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Okay, but do they wear certain things to show that they are of royalty? Yes. Okay, so the technical, this is the definition, it's decorations or insignia indicative of an office or membership. Okay, so in our context, what does it mean? The seeker's regalia. So we said this is the seeker of Islamic knowledge, of any knowledge that will be helpful in the hereafter. What is the regalia for that type of person? What is the what are what are the decorations for that type of person? Yes. Okay, but what's his regalia? So how how would I, if I'm a seeker of Islamic knowledge, what's my regalia? Yes, barakallahu fiq. He said it's your akhlaq. What is akhlaq? It's your manners, your etiquette, your behavior. A person will behave with you, and simply based on your behavior, they're like, you know what, you seem like a seeker of Islamic knowledge. You're a talib in. You're a student of sacred knowledge. Simply by your behavior. You don't have to wear anything. So we're not actually talking about a physical thing that a person wears. We're talking about now it's an ornament or a decoration that will show in the person's behavior. That will automatically distinguish them from a regular person. This doesn't mean, by the way, that the regular person doesn't have akhlaq. This doesn't mean that they don't have good manners. But it means that the student of knowledge uh, has so much akhlaq that the people will have no doubt that this person is actually a student of knowledge. That they are a seeker of Islamic sacred knowledge. Simply by the way that they behave. Make sense? Okay. So we said it's the manners and behaviors that decorate those who seek Sacred knowledge. That's my definition. The manners and behaviors that decorate those who seek sacred knowledge. Your manners are your decoration now. Because your manners, <laughs> believe it or not, this is true, your manners will cover up your faults and mistakes. Your manners will make people not see those things. Because the thing is, we are imperfect. We have flaws. Every single one of us, we have mistakes. But when people don't see that, it's because they're seeing the decoration that you've decorated yourself, which is good manners. But if you don't have good manners, you're going to see everything wrong with you. This is why good manners are so important. So if we're talking about manners, I have a question for everybody. Why should we study manners? Why are manners, are manners really that important? Do we have to study them? I mean, a lot of us gain good manners at our homes, right? Our parents... Uh, teach us good manners, most of our parents, I hope. <laughs> okay? I know some parents just kind of leave their kids, learn whatever, and they don't have good manners. But most of us, alhamdulillah, the fact that we're here in the masjid, proves to a certain point that our parents actually did instill in us good manners. But manners are huge. And sometimes we might not realize when we're not using manners. This, by the way, doesn't mean that I'm saying that what you learned at home isn't beneficial. No. But a lot of times we can't put words to what we already know. And so this class will help us put words to what we already have learned. It'll help us add to those manners. It will be a review for good manners that we already have. So all in all, this is actually a very good thing that we can actually study this and learn on a more deeper level, inshallah ta'ala. So I don't want anybody to think that we don't have good manners and this is why we need to learn them. No, Blax. It's actually to add on to what we already have. And this is why Prophet Muhammad himself وسلم, said, I have only been sent to perfect good manners. He said perfect and not teach because people already had a lot of good manners, but his point was to add on to them, perfect them, maybe fill in the gaps, maybe adjust a few here and there, maybe correct the intentions that were involved in them. You know, some, some of the Arabs were very generous, but when they would find out that the people didn't know who they were, they weren't generous anymore. Which shows us that they were only generous because they wanted it to be known that they were generous, not because they were actually um, sincerely generous to other people, if that makes sense. Okay? So, there is a debate. 
And this debate actually took place in front of me. It was one of the, I, I enjoyed this debate probably more than <laughs> I usually enjoy debates. Two of some of my favorite teachers um, had this debate. It was live um, when I was overseas. And this is the debate question right here. Would you rather marry a spouse who has good manners or good knowledge? I want you guys to think about this. <laughs> Would you rather marry a spouse who has good manners or good knowledge? A lot of good manners or a lot of good, no uh, good knowledge? So the sister is going ahead and answering. She's saying good manners. Anybody, anybody agree with that, that it's good manners? Raise your hand. Wow, there's a lot. Okay. Anybody says that it's good knowledge? One, two, three, <laughs> four... <laughs> Five, maybe. <laughs> okay, not a lot of people agree with the whole knowledge. Okay, six. So the people who say manners, why is it manners? If you say manners. He says good akhlaq. But what, let's say they're ignorant though. They don't know much about Islam. But they're, they're nice, they're good behavior. Yes. So if you have good manners, you can actually learn more. Okay, you can gain more knowledge. Okay, I can see this. Yeah? You learn more and help others. You help others. So you're going to be helpful to your spouse if you have good manners? Okay, that's important. <laughs> yes? Uh huh. So manners is applying that knowledge. Good. Did you guys hear that? Manners is applying that knowledge. Okay. What else? If you say that it's knowledge, for the people who said that it was knowledge, why, why did you say it was knowledge? Okay. So both have elements of being correct. I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll be fair. And, and when I heard this debate, it was very... Now, I personally sided with the person who argued for good manners. Because without a doubt, a person with good manners can always learn more. Because they have good manners, it actually will allow them to humble themselves to accept what is being said. Because a lot of times we need humbleness in our lives to accept the opinions of others and whatnot. Good knowledge, when we mean by this, is the theoretical knowledge. Meaning their head is full of information, right? And they might even apply a lot of it. But if they don't have a good way of dealing with the people around them, do you think the people around them are going to accept that knowledge? No, and in fact, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ warned against such people. So there was a Sahabi, his name is Mu'adh. And the, he used to pray, lead Fajr, not in, in, in Masjid Nabawi, in another Masjid that was in Medina, in his neighborhood. And people would come and they would pray behind him. And a man came and he tells the Prophet ﷺ, he's like, Ya Rasulullah, I have an issue with Mu'adh. He says, what's your issue? He says, when I go for Fajr, I actually show up late. And I show up late on purpose. Why do you show up late on purpose? To the Salah, you're showing up late on purpose? He says, yes. Because Mu'adh, every day in the morning, he recites Surah Al-Baqarah. And Surah Al-Baqarah is way too long for a regular Salah. Okay? And he says, I go in there and I show up late on purpose because I can't stand there for that long. I get tired, my legs are weak and all these things. And he's just over there reciting like it's no one's business. So then the Prophet ﷺ calls Mu'adh and he says, أَفَتَّانٌ أَنْتَ يَا مُعَاذ Are you a causer of fitna, O Mu'adh? Are you a, listen to what he says, are you a causer of fitna? Fitna is a trial and tribulation, a big problem. He says, why are you causing problems of Mu'adh? He says, indeed, إِنَّ minkum." Munafirin. There are some amongst you who are munafirin, meaning they turn people away from Islam. Because they're so rigid and strict in the way that they apply Islam, that they actually turn people away. And he was warning Mu'adh to be amongst these people. Because Mu'adh, in his rigidness, in how much he wanted to uh, uh, be like strict, I'm going to read Surah Al-Baqarah, I'm going to be so diligent. But then you're forcing all these other people to do it with you? Haram. Other, these other people can't. And so he caused a big fitna for those people. And he said, you can't do this. 
you can't be so diligent to where you detract others. Okay? And so this is, this is an, an example of doing that. Mu'adh had a lot of good knowledge. But in applying that, he actually turned people away. And that's what we cannot do. This is why akhlaq is so important. Akhlaq is important because it allows us to live in harmony with others. Akhlaq is so important because it allows us to humble ourselves. It allows us to dedicate ourselves. And we're going to go into all of these manners as well. Plus, somebody said this point, and this is exactly on point. Manners is the application of that knowledge. And then if a person has a lot of theoretical knowledge, but in their behavior it's not showing, then we can definitely argue that the knowledge doesn't have a lot of fruit. There aren't that many fruits for that knowledge. It's not that well applied. Now, in our study of the manners, I want you guys to make note of a few points. Some of what we're going to say is mandatory for every Muslim, regardless of whether they are a seeker of knowledge or not. Some of them are mustahab, they're recommended. Some of the things that we're going to talk about, okay? So if it's recommended, you can apply it, you get reward, but if you don't, that's fine. But some of these are mandatory, meaning every Muslim should know them. And you have to know them. Some of the things um, that we are going to warn against, because there are manners that we should stay away from. Some of them are disliked, meaning they're makruh, meaning it's better if you leave it, but if you don't, there's no sin, inshallah ta'ala. But leaving some of these is actually mandatory. You have to leave them. So some of the bad manners that we're going to talk about are actually haram manners. They're prohibited. You cannot do them in any circumstances. Okay? So far so good. So there's a lot of different types of manners when it comes to prohibition and all of these things. And now I have this question that I'm proposing for you guys to think about. If knowledge isn't put into action, can we actually call it knowledge? No. We can't? But what is it? Theory? Information? Trivial knowledge. Has anybody heard trivial knowledge? It doesn't really have an effect. Just information. And we have a lot of Muslims, unfortunately, who have a lot of information in their heads. Okay? And we don't apply it in our lives. And I know myself, I'm included in this category, without a doubt. We have knowledge, we have information, but we're not applying at all. This is why learning these types of things will help us put into practice the things that we know. Because just learning fiqh, salah, ibadah, you know, tawheed, all these things, doesn't really benefit us much if we're not applying it and it's not showing in our regalia, right? In our behavior. That's why it's so important. Okay? And like I said, this is the last one. Are all of these... Are all of these uh, manners just for the seekers? Are all of these manners just for the seekers? No. No. Are they for everybody? Yes. So why are we singling out seekers of knowledge? If they're for everybody, then we should just say manners of the Muslim. Sah? But why are we saying it's, it's particularly for the seeker of Islamic knowledge? Yes. Because what? Because they, they're going to seek knowledge? Uh-huh. Okay. There's an added burden on the seeker of Islamic knowledge because they represent something. Okay, they represent an ideal. They represent a person. They represent what Allah actually wants from a lot of Muslims, right? And a lot of times they'll be role models. Do we want our role models to have bad manners? To be very blunt, to be very dry? or to be very, like people that we can't relate to, we can't talk to. No, of course we don't want this. And if that actually happens, unfortunately what happens is, if the seeker of knowledge is that type of person who's very dry, very blunt, very difficult to deal with, they'll actually turn people away from Islam. So this is why there's an added burden on the people who do seek Islamic knowledge to have good manners in order to make people love not only that person, but by extension what that person stands for which is sacred Islamic knowledge, beneficial knowledge, okay? That's why there's an added burden there. It's to protect their reputation, it's because they are 
role models, and it's because the knowledge that they seek dictates that they behave in a certain way. So far, so good? Okay, that was the introduction. Now we're at section one, the seeker's inner self. I took this photo when I went camping a few years ago. <laughs> So it's copyrighted, nobody can take it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay? So, the seeker's inner self. So this whole section we're going to discuss, and we're going to discuss it for the next few weeks, which is, um, how do you work on your inner self? Okay? Then there's going to be a section dedicated to the outer self, a section dedicated to your co-students who work with you, a section dedicated to how you deal with your teachers, and a section, how do, you, how do you deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay? Tayyib. Knowledge is worship. This is number one. Knowledge is worship. This is the fundamental foundation of the regalia. Knowing that knowledge is worship. Because some people think that knowledge leads you to worship. That knowledge is a means to worship, right? But that's actually a, a wrong way of thinking about it, a very limited way. The better way to think about it is that knowledge itself is an act of worship. Seeking it is an act of worship. That knowledge that you have is, in fact, an act of worship. Reviewing it, growing it, um, tailoring it, reviewing it, asking questions, etc. That actually is an act of worship in and of itself. It doesn't lead you just to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it actually is an act of worship. Okay? This is why it's so important. Knowledge, of course, is fundamental to everything in life. So this idea that learning anything is an act of worship is actually a very good thing. And this way, in almost everything that we do, you can be rewarded for when you have that proper knowledge. Some scholars have said, knowledge is the secretive prayer and the worship of the heart. Hiya salatu sir wa ibadatul qalb. In Arabic he says, Hiya salatu sir wa ibadatul qalb. What do they mean salatu sir? If you're just sitting there, right now, on your chair, can you pray? I mean, if you're in the masjid, you have to stand up and pray, right? You can't just sit down unless you, you, know, you, you twisted your ankle like Brother Omar did. Okay? But here they're saying that knowledge that you have in your heart is a way that you can pray in secret without actually getting up. When you're thinking about that knowledge, reviewing it, thinking about what you understand, analyzing it, being critical about it, okay, reviewing it, all these things, that is actually a secretive prayer and that completely takes place in your mind and in your heart. This is why it is an act of worship. Because ultimately what you're thinking about is that knowledge, that sacred knowledge that will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why it's actually a secretive act of worship. And it's amazing that you can do this. You can be sitting there and you're just thinking about what it is that you know about a certain topic. Any topic, any important sacred topic, okay, can lead you to this place. This is why Imam Ahmad has the following quote. Knowledge has no equal. For the one who has proper intention. لَيْسَ لِلْعِلْمِ مَثِيلٌ لِمَنْ صَفَّى نِيَّتَهِ Okay? He said, there is no equal to knowledge in any act of worship. So he's saying, Imam Ahmad is saying, that knowledge is a better act of worship than salah, is a better act of worship than zakah, is better than psalm, is better than hajj. Why? Why is he saying this? Can anybody guess? Because it's needed for all of those. I can't pray until I have knowledge, <laughs> until I learn how to pray. I can't pay zakah until I have knowledge on how to pay my zakah. I can't fast until I learn how to fast. I can't go to hajj until I learn how to do my hajj. Okay? And because all of them, they share the idea of knowledge, and not only those, but every act of worship that a Muslim does. Okay? I have to have knowledge for it. So he's saying that knowledge in itself has no equal if the intention is there. Let me ask you guys this. What is the proper intention? He was asked this. 
وَكَيْفَ ذَلِكَ يَا إِمَامِ How is this? How does he do it? Who can guess? This is what he said. Removal of ignorance from oneself and others. This is what you should intend. When learning, it's the removal of ignorance. Not just gaining knowledge, but you're removing something as well. You're removing that description of ignorance from oneself and from others around them. I no longer want to be an ignorant person. I, know, I no longer want to be in darkness. This is his answer. It's very profound. He doesn't say gaining knowledge. He said removal of ignorance. Okay? Tayyib. We're going to continue. Knowledge is an act of worship. Since it is an act of worship, it has the same requirements for acceptance as any other act of worship. And there are two requirements, two things that make any act of worship acceptable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can tell me what they are? If it is an act of worship, if we agree upon this point, there are two conditions. What are the conditions? For any act of worship to be accepted. Intention, which is sincerity, yes. Then what's number two? Yes. According to the teachings of Islam. So if I do an act of worship, that's correct. We're going to have a simpler term for it. So the first condition is, it has to be sincerely for Allah. If I do salah correctly, according to the teachings of Islam, but I'm not doing it sincerely for Allah, will Allah accept it from me? No, He won't. And if I do my salah sincerely, but I'm praying in my own way, I say, you know what, I'm going to make sujood five times, and no rukur, and I'm just going to sit the whole time. This is my salah. I came up with a new way of salah. Will Allah accept that from me? No. So it has to have two conditions to be accepted. One, sincerity. And two, we call it in Arabic, al-mutaba'a, which is adherence to the sunnah. Sincerity to Allah, adherence to the sunnah. Sincerity to Allah, adherence to the sunnah. And it's very easy to memorize this. All you have to memorize is, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Does everybody know La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? <laughs> I hope everybody knows this, right? Does everybody know La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? Sincerity to Allah is La ilaha illallah. And following the sunnah is Muhammad Rasulullah. This is why the shahada tells us how Allah accepts our deeds. So if you know the shahada, you know this already. If you know the shahada, you already know this. Tayyib, we're going to continue. We're going to talk about the first part, which is sincerity to Allah. Okay? The first condition, which is sincerity to Allah. This is very important. I know we've heard many lectures about sincerity to Allah, and we're going to hear one again, and we're going to hear them in the future, because it's that important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَاء Okay, in Surah Al-Bayyinah, he says, and they were not commanded except to worship Allah, sincere to Him in the religion, inclining to the truth. This is the only thing that they were commanded with. You have to be sincere to Allah, sincerity. Sincerity is the most important thing. So if you say, what's the proof that you have to be sincere in your actions to Allah? You can quote this verse. It's in Surah al bayyinah Okay? Remember we said that knowledge is knowing the truth with the proof. Knowing the truth with its relevant proof. This is the proof for it. This is what Allah says. From the hadith, Deeds are but by intentions. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ If your niyyah isn't there, if it's not for the sake of Allah, خلاص, that, there goes your amal. Okay, what happens if sincerity is gone? Is there any deed left? Can you seek proper knowledge? So we said, that, remember, we're applying this to knowledge. So if my sincerity is gone from my knowledge, what happens to my knowledge? Does it get corrupted? Yes. It can get corrupted. It probably won't be applied correctly. Will Allah reward me for it? No. Okay? This is why it's very dangerous. We have to, we have to, we have to always correct our intentions and why we seek knowledge. If we are a seeker of knowledge, right? The first step in gaining good regalia is in making sure sincerity is there. Okay, this is a list. It's not a comprehensive list of some of the destroyers of intentions. 
These are what I'm calling the destroyers of intentions. This is directly from his book, Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid. He makes this a quick list in his book. Okay? And I'm just taking it directly from him. These are the things that he listed. Okay? This is number one, Riya, which is wanting to be seen by others. Meaning, so when we apply it to knowledge, that's the general, general Riya, right? But when it comes to knowledge, that means you want to be seen as a knowledgeable person. You want people to recognize, oh, this guy, mashallah, has a lot of knowledge. If that was your intention in seeking the knowledge, then that's riya, and that's an invalid intention. What if, and I'm going to ask this question, I'm getting ahead of myself, this question I have it at the bottom. What if a person says, but I want to benefit others. I want to benefit others in my knowledge, but inevitably, they're going to say, oh, look at this guy, mashallah, he has a lot of knowledge. What do I do then? Do I say, you know what, khalas, I won't seek knowledge because people will recognize me that I have knowledge? No. If it's an inevitable outcome, but that wasn't your intention, that's fine. You guys understand this point? This is a very technical point. But it's... it's it, I don't want it to sound like we're splitting hairs, but this is truly how it is. If you sought knowledge to help others, because that's what Imam Ahmad said. He said, you want to remove ignorance from yourself and others. And that by removing it from others, they come to recognize your knowledge. And then they say, oh, look at so-and-so, he's knowledgeable. That's fine because that wasn't your intention. Your intention was to benefit others. And the fact that there was an inevitable outcome, that's fine. Because that was never your intention. Now, the danger is, don't let that become your intention. Because later on, your intention can change. This is why it's so important to continuously review your intentions. You can't just say, well, when I initially sought knowledge, my intention was fine. No, 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 no. Right now, today, where is your intention still? You can't remove that. You have to always keep reviewing your intention on a daily basis, on a nightly basis. Okay? This is why it's so, the idea of intentions is so important. So we have riya. Related to it is what we call sum'ah. Sum'ah, which is uh, wanting to be heard. So people will talk about you. They won't show you, but you want to be heard. Oh, so-and-so is very knowledgeable. Or so-and-so has a lot of good knowledge or whatever. That also hurts your sincerity. Wanting to stand apart, meaning you want to be seen as, oh, I have a lot of knowledge. You want to excel above others. Which obviously leads to this, wanting to look down on others. You want to be in a high place so that you can look down on these people and be like, ah, oh, these people don't know ahkam al-talaq, or they don't know ahkam al rida or they don't know ahkam al wiratha And you're like, ah, oh, these ignorant people. Okay? If you seek knowledge to look down on others, this is obviously bad. You're not, that's not the point of the knowledge. And sometimes it can lead to that. Okay, and this is why, like we said, we have to continuously review it. You start learning things that other people don't have, it doesn't cause you to look down upon them. It shouldn't. Using it as a means for an unrighteous goal. And we have a tubuliyat. We'll mention what a tubuliyat is. He mentions this word, a tubuliyat, which is a very unique word. And we're going to mention what that means. Okay? Means for an unrighteous goal. So, a person goes and he says, You know what? I heard that they pay imams really well. So, I want to go and learn, uh, uh, which of course is not the case. But he says, I want to go and, and um, I'm going to go learn Islamic knowledge and I'm going to be hired as an imam and they're going to pay me a salary and that's it. That's good. What's his intention now in learning Islamic knowledge? It's money. Tayyib, does that mean that an imam cannot get paid? Tayyib, how do you how do you how do you reconcile these two issues? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. Recognize the Imam and what his situation is, Tayyib. Why did he so if we go back, if he originally learnt the Islamic knowledge just to get a paycheck, this is bad. If he originally learned to benefit himself and benefit others, that's good. And then one of the things that happened, the inevitable was, that he was going to get paid for that, that's fine. Because that wasn't his original intention. Remember we said the same thing about the, uh, the previous scenario, where the person was being recognized for his knowledge, but that wasn't his intention. His intention was to benefit others. 
Do you guys see that? If recognition happens, that's an inevitable outcome in some cases. Okay, خلاص, that's fine. Same thing as getting paid for learning knowledge or by benefiting others. And this is why, like uh, for example, an author can author a book and sell it of Islamic knowledge. So he's getting paid for his knowledge, if you think about it. But that wasn't his intention at all. His intention was to benefit others. And obviously he needs to be able to put food on the table and whatnot and pay for his expenses and all these other things that he's doing. But his primary intention should have never been financial. Primary intention should always be what? It's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is an act of worship. Okay? Does that make sense? I hope this is clear inshallah. Yes? You have to... Re yeah, that, yeah that's, that's dangerous. You have to review it. You have to think about it every day. Like, why am I doing this? What's my intention? No, of course not. No. No, no. So that's actually one of the traps of shaitan that he tries to make you give it up. He says, you know what? Since you can't keep a pure intention and seeking knowledge, well, let's give it up, dude. Because you're not going to keep a pure intention. Allah's not going to accept it from you. Give it up. Don't learn. Guess what? That's a trap of shaitan. Because the reality is, if you're struggling with it, and you know that the struggle is real, and you're trying your best, this is all that you, you can be held accountable for. And you're good. You'll be fine. Most people struggle with their intentions. This is completely normal. This is not a... This is not, yani, you shouldn't stop just because you can't completely perfect your intentions. And, and so this is one of the traps of shaitan to get you to stop, where he says, hey, you can't perfect your intentions, khalas, just give up. No. I wouldn't give up. I would actually fight shaitan and be like, no, I'm going to continue. I know that my intentions are not where I want them to be, but I'm working on it and I'm going to continue to work on it. Yes. Okay. At-tubuliyat. At-tubuliyat comes from the word tabla, or tabl, which is a drum. And he says you should avoid drum-like issues. And what he means by this is that there are some people who learn like really exotic points really points that are kind of out there. Nobody knows about them. And then this person knows them and starts to preach them in order to be known for a certain topic. And it becomes like a drum that makes a really loud noise that this person is known for. You say a name, oh yeah, that sheikh he always talks about this. That's his topic. So now he becomes known like a person with a drum that he always beats that same drum. He's always talking about that same topic. And Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid was saying, that if you're sincere, you should avoid tubuliyat. You should stick to the basics as much as possible, and then from there go to more obscure things. But there are people who will start with the obscure, <laughs> and their basics are really terrible. Okay? So we have to, you have to be wary of this as well. Tayyib. Knowledge is worth it. How do we protect our intentions? How do we protect our sincerity? Number one, knowing who Allah is. And number two, knowing our place, who we are. If we are seekers of knowledge, who is this knowledge for? What are we doing it for? Understanding our place in the sense that we are this weak human being, we only know what Allah has taught us. And therefore, if we try to displease Allah in our intentions, Allah is not going to teach us more. This is why, Allah. the last part of this whole workshop is on a verse of how to actually gain more knowledge. One of the easiest ways to gain more knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in a verse. Understanding who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. He's the all-wise, He's the all-knowing, He's the all-hearing, He's the all-capable. He has power over everything. He's transcendent above His creation. Nothing is comparable to Him. If it weren't for Him, you wouldn't be alive. You wouldn't, be have, you wouldn't even have the ability to learn. Right? You wouldn't have the ability to do anything. Understanding that when you try to decorate yourself with this regalia to have sincerity, that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who grants you ultimate sincerity. Which is why one of the best mechanisms for gaining that sincerity is to ask Allah. Allahumma rzuqni al-ikhlasa fil qawli wal amal. You say, oh Allah, grant me ikhlas, grant me sincerity in everything I say and everything I do. This is a dua that we should be saying on a regular basis. Oh Allah, make me sincere in everything that I do for you. Because if Allah doesn't help you, no one can help you. And if Allah helps you, khalas, that's it, you're good. Understanding who you are in the sense that I'm a human being, I'm flawed, I'm weak, my intention can change. And it does change. And so understanding your weakness, 
means that you should strengthen yourself in that area. Okay, this is the question that we asked. What if a person wants to benefit others in knowledge? How is this different than wanting to be seen as knowledgeable? We mentioned there's a key difference. If one, if you want to benefit others, and then you're seen as a knowledgeable person, خلاص. But it's not the other way around. It's not that you want to be seen, and then you benefit others. You can't flip it. Okay? What about competing in knowledge? What do you guys think? Is this something that's good for sincerity or bad? Competing in knowledge. <laughs> huh? It depends on the intentions. Yes, it depends on the reason why. If the person is competing, because they know that the competing will actually help them excel, but their intention is still for the sake of Allah, that's completely fine. Ahlan wa sahlan. But if his only intention is competing, is to show the other person and be like, hey, I'm better than you. I beat you in this. I memorized more Quran than you. What now? <laughs> okay? Then obviously that's a bad intention. You can't have that intention. Okay, so competing, it also goes back to your intentions. What about seeking recognition through a degree? This one was discussed specifically by Sheikh Nur Thaymeen. He says, what about seeking a degree? You're seeking recognition because you want people to say, hey, this guy knows this much Islamic knowledge through a degree. Does that affect intentions? Huh? It can affect a person's intention. However, if the person wants to benefit others, and in order for him to benefit others, he knows that he can't get hired at a school or university or a masjid unless he has the degree, and that the degree is the only way for him to be able to teach and benefit others, then yes, he can totally go for the degree. That's not a problem. Okay? Because now it's a, it's a, it's a necessary tool a means to get to that goal of benefiting others, removing ignorance from others. But, if his intention in getting the degree is so that people say, Dr. so-and-so, PhD, you know, at the end, so-and-so, at the end, PhD, MA, ML, you know, MF, whatever, you know, they have all these, uh, MS, uh, Sismo, MBA, whatever. Okay, all these different stuff that they add at the end, right? If they actually, their intention in seeking the degree is the recognition itself so that people praise him and look, look, mashallah, this guy, you know, how many degrees he has, how many degrees do you have? And he's like, I have five, right? If that was his intention, khalas, that's a problem. But by default, if you know that the only way that you can benefit others is by getting a degree, then go ahead and get the degree. And if the only way that you can learn is by going through a degree program, get the degree, that's not a problem. So a degree in of itself is not a bad thing. And a lot of times it's actually a tool for good because this actually helps you get where you want to be, where you need to benefit others. But if your intention was in getting it so that they praise you, khalas, then this is a different problem. Okay, two more slides left. These are quick. Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah says, مَا عَلَجْتُ شَيْئًا أَشَدُّ عَلَيَّ مِنْ نِيَّتِي I have never, I have never worked on something more difficult than my intentions. This is a man who's being honest. And he's a great scholar of Islam. He's one of the most knowledgeable of the tabi'een, of the successors, right? But he says, there's nothing that was more difficult for me to cure Okay, to work on than my own intentions. And this is him being honest and sincere in the sense that he knows that it's very hard to keep you know, sincerity going on and that it changes. And this is why he says, I'm working on it. Okay, Umar ibn Dhar, he is a third generation of the Muslims and he, his father was a scholar. His name is Abdullah ibn Zurara. But he's not the Sahabi Ibn Zurara, that's a, um, a different Sahabi. He says that he asked his father, why do people get affected when you preach? Meaning, they start to cry or they get trembled or their iman increases. When you preach, he's telling his father this. But when others do, they're not affected at all. And his father, rahimahullah, he says, the mourning crier is not like the rented one. Do you guys understand this? So they used, to, they used to hire people to cry at a janazah. 
They used to pay a person, this is in Jahiliya days, they used to bring a lady or a guy and they'd pay them money to cry and wail during the janazah. They call them a na'iha. Okay? <laughs> and this person would be an actor, of course, and just start to bawl and then just cause everybody else to start crying and all these things. But he's saying that the mourning one, the one who's truly going through the loss, is always, always completely different than the one who's paid money to cry. Do you guys understand this concept now? So he's saying that the person who's sincere in what they're teaching, it's always going to have an effect on people. When the person versus the person who's just paid to do something and give a talk, um, and then move on. Okay? That's why sincerity is so important. We have to work on ourselves. That the mourning crier, the crier who's actually going through the sadness, is obviously not like the rented one. Now, these two people, these are two examples. Did they say these things to boast? Are they boasting here? What's the ruling on boasting or praising oneself in Islam? Can we praise ourselves in Islam? No, we cannot. We cannot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in multiple places, وَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not praise yourselves. Do not claim righteousness for yourselves. You can't. Tayyip, aren't these people in a way praising themselves? Why did they do this? It's actually not that they were praising themselves, it's that they were trying to teach a very important point and they were using themselves as examples in that, in that point to their students. So they're actually teaching a lesson. This is why there's a lot of sheikhs that say personal stories, not to boast to their students, because if they wanted to boast, they would just make it public, and, but to their students who they want to help and benefit, they would tell them things in order for them to relate to it directly. Be like, hey, look, this is what, this is what something that I even go through myself. Right? Adherence to the sunnah. Remember, this is the second criteria for the acceptance of a deed. Number one was sincerity. Number two is adherence to the sunnah, right? This is Muhammad Rasulullah. We just finished La ilaha illallah. Now we're on Muhammad Rasulullah, which is mutaba'ah or yani mutaba'ah to as sunnah, which is adherence to the sunnah. However, Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid does not call it mutaba'ah. He calls it his second his second condition for the acceptance of a deed, he says it's actually love of Allah and His Messenger. And I thought that this was brilliant. This is one of the most brilliant things I've seen in a while. And this shows you completely like how this guy thinks on a deeper level than most, yani, not even most people, most scholars. He doesn't call it, most scholars always call it mutaba'ah. But he doesn't, he calls it mahabbatullahi wa rasul. He calls it the love of Allah and His Messenger. Why? He quotes Ibn al-Qayyim. Ibn al-Qayyim says, Love is at the source of every human action. If you do not believe this, I don't know what's wrong with you. Or why you do anything that you do in your life. Love is at the source of every human action. Anything that you do right now, think about it. There has to be love for something at its source. There always is. This is why love is so powerful in our lives. Love motivates us to do sometimes crazy things that don't make any sense. <laughs> okay? Love affects us in a way, sometimes it causes people to get sick. Okay? Sometimes it causes an intoxication of the mind, it clouds our judgment, all of these things. But love, when actually utilized in a correct way, when it's harnessed in such a good way, it's the best motivator that we have available to us. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ that there are people uh, that they have love for others more than they do for Allah. But that the people who believe love Allah more. There are people who take andad, they take others besides Allah, and they love them like they should love Allah. But the people who believe, the believers, love Allah more than those people love their own idols. Because the believer always should love Allah more than anybody loves anything else. And this is the, 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 the rule that we should go by. Okay? Love causes us to imitate others. Love causes us to obey them. If I love Allah's messenger, won't I obey him? If I love Allah, won't I obey Him? Yes, I will. This is why he doesn't say it's adherence. 
He says, love. Because it has to start from a place of love. If it doesn't start from a place of love, it's not going to last. It's not going to be there. So if I have mutaba'ah, if I'm following the sunnah, I should be following the sunnah because I love the Prophet ﷺ. Because I love the one who sent the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? Then he quotes a verse which is called the verse of the test. It's called Ayatul Mihna. Okay? The verse of the test. What is this verse? It's in Surah Al Imran. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ He said, say, if you love Allah. Remember what he's saying, he's calling it love of Allah. And this verse is proof for why he calls it this. If you love Allah, because here's the thing. How many people here love Allah? Raise your hands. Good. Excellent. That's what we want. How many people are truthful in what they say? I don't want you to raise your hands. Okay? We actually have a way to find out who's truthful. This verse. That's why it's called the test. If you say you love Allah, here's the proof. If you love Allah, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ Allah, If you should love Allah, then follow me. Who's follow me? That's Prophet Muhammad <laughs> Do you see why it's a test? If a person says, I love Allah, then they need to be following the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why he doesn't call it following the Prophet ﷺ. He says it's loving Allah and His Messenger. Okay? If you love Allah, this is what Allah is saying. If you love Allah, then you'll follow me, meaning the Prophet ﷺ. And not only will you be truthful in that, but then he says, and Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. Following the sunnah, is a method to get forgiveness of sins. It's the method through which Allah will love us. If Allah loves us, is there anything else that we need? Tell me, is there anything else that we need? No. Khalas. If Allah loves you, that's it. You're done. And that's what we want. And that's why he's, he didn't jump. Yani there's something missing in this verse. He didn't say, if you follow the messenger, then you love Allah, and then Allah will love you back. He immediately jumped to the fact that Allah will love you back immediately. And that's what we want. Out of us loving Allah is that we want Allah to love us back. And if Allah loves us, خلاص, do you think Allah will punish us? Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let us perish? Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let any harm afflict us? Do you think that the person will be sad or depressed or go through difficulties or challenges that they cannot overcome? Yes, challenges will happen, but it will never be a challenge that you cannot overcome. And that's the reality. Okay? That's why this verse is so important. So he doesn't call it adherence to the sunnah, he calls it love of Allah and His Messenger for that reason. So, sincerity and love of Allah and His Messenger are the crowns of the regalia. Without them there is no regalia. Remember what we said, regalia is the decoration. These two that we just talked about is the taj, it's the crown. The word taj means crown. This is what he says in his book, he says this is the crown. If you don't have this, you don't have any regalia. If the king doesn't have his crown, is he a king? No. This is why he says, without both of these that we just talked about, sincerity and love for Allah and His Messenger, without these there's no crown, there's no regalia. The rest of the ensemble doesn't really make any sense. The king without his crown is no one. The queen without her crown is no one. The prince without his crown is no one. Okay? And then last we have this verse. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِن تَتَّقُوا اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ فُرْقَانًا وَيُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ O you who have believed, have taqwa of Allah. And He will make for you a furqan. We're just going to focus on this part. A furqan, what does that mean? A furqan in Arabic is a criterion, a differentiator, a standard for evaluating. If you have consciousness of Allah, awareness of Allah, fear of Allah, Allah will give you a criterion. And a criterion in English, the definition is something through which you evaluate all other things. It's a tool of measuring. I can evaluate truth from falsehood. I can see light from darkness. I can see right from wrong when I have a furqan. Without that furqan, I can't see. This is why there are so many people that are confused about so many different things now in the world. We have Muslims that come to us all the time and they're like, Shaykh, I have this issue and I'm so confused about it. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what's right and wrong. And this is driving me nuts. 
And this is a common problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you first and foremost, if you want a furqan, a way to identify right and wrong, you have to have taqwa of Allah. Without the taqwa of Allah, it's not going to happen. And that criterion will take place through one of three methods that the Shaykh has mentioned. These three methods are knowledge, learning, what is, and this is what we're trying to do now. And then the two other methods, we actually have no control over. Number two is firasa, and number three is ilham. <laughs> we're not going to talk about them today, I'm just going to mention what they are, but we're not going to talk about them today. Later on, we will, inshallah ta'ala, address these other two. Knowledge is you by sitting in a class or reading a book, that's true knowledge. Firasa is a light that Allah gives the believer, okay, through which they can see things as they truly are either in individuals, or in situations, or in whatever is going on. You'll meet a person, and you'll talk to them, and you'll immediately know that they're lying. You have no idea why. But you know definitively, without any doubt, that they're lying to you. This happens to the believer. This happens to almost everybody, by the way, when Allah wants them to see this. But this is actually a gift that's given to the believer, and this, this verse is proof for this. And of course, Prophet Muhammad has a hadith. He says, Ittaqu firasat al mu'min. He says, Beware of the firasa of the believer, because Allah is the one who's giving them this firasa, meaning the ability to see things as they truly are. You'll meet a person, you know that there's something off by this person. I don't know what it is, but I just got this weird feeling. I'm going to stay away from this guy. This is firasa. Firasa is that you see a person, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he went to go learn. Now, there are specific things that you can learn about Firasa. I actually read a whole book, it's about 250 pages on Firasa, that tells you how to read expressions, how to look into people, etc. But there's an, an added quality which only comes through Iman, right? Um, Imam al-Shafi'i, he says, I went to Yemen, I spent four years learning Firasa. I came back, we got hosted by this Bedouin tribe, and as soon as I met the person, my firasa told me, this guy is a thief, this guy is a cheater, this guy is going to do something bad to us. But the guy's behavior said the complete opposite. He hosted them, and he was very generous, and they said, you know, now the, the, in Islam, if you are hosted by somebody, as a guest, you have the right to stay there up to three days. So if anybody, if I come to your house as a guest, you have to host me for three days. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> okay, according to Islamic yani, principles, three days. And then after this, you have to either be on your way or you have to pay now. But they, you should host a guest for three days. This is standard. Because back then they didn't have hotels, they didn't have all these other things, right? So this guy hosted them for three days. Generous. Food, water, everything that they needed was there. And Imam al-Shafi'i is scratching his head. And at the time he was still young. He wasn't this big Imam yet. He was still learning. He's scratching his head and he's like, Man, I just spent all these years in Yemen for nothing. The first test I have for my farasa and I'm completely off by this guy. This guy is like generous, all these things. He's like, man, I just wasted all that time. This farasa has nothing. This farasa has no basis. I'm not going to do it ever again. He's regretting the whole thing. They're about to leave. <laughs> and the man sees them about to leave and he says, does anybody know which tribe I am from? And the whole group, Imam Shafi was in a group, and they're all looking at each other like, no, we have no idea which tribe you're from. He's like, then I'm going to hold you guys hostage until you pay me for everything that I just gave you. <laughs> he held their animals, he held all their possessions, until they paid him for the three days of food and water and all of these things. And at that moment, everybody was extremely unhappy. They were completely sad, except for Mehmet Shafi'i. He had a huge smile on his face. He's like, yes, I was right about this guy. <laughs> now the guy's just robbing him, but he's still happy that he's robbing him because he was right about his farasa. He knew that there was something up with this guy, but he didn't know what it was. Okay? Farasa works. Then the last one is ilham. Ilham, which is unspoken divine revelation. It's not wahi. Wahi is divine revelation, right? Wahi is revelation, it's the Qur'an and the Sunnah, all these things. But there is ilham, and the Prophet actually spoke about ilham. 
And ilham is a thought or an idea or a rush that comes into a person's mind or heart that didn't used to be there. And it comes at extremely difficult moments a lot of times. You act or you say something you're like, man, I didn't know how I said that. Or I didn't know how I knew how to do this thing, but I did it and it turned out to be the right decision. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps people. And He helps those believers. But remember, that only, help, that only happens when the person has taqwa. This verse mentions that. Of course, then the rest of the, the, the rest of the taqwa, the benefits are that not only will you get that furqan, which is that help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the situations that you face, but that Allah will expiate for you your sins, He will forgive you for everything you do, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the possessor of great bounty. So this is the end of the section of knowledge is worship.